4160, oh, that is 4180, I'm not yet used to it, Introduction to Computational Fluid Dynamics. My name is Bernhard Müller, I'm a professor of this subject, Computational Fluid Dynamics. And we have a team here, consisting of my colleague, Reda Christofferson, who will be responsible for the assignments, for the exercises, and uh, Jürgen Ornes, who will be the, with us, the scientific assistant in this course. The teaching assistant that stood us, um, Alexander Reinertsen, will join us on Monday. So, what is uh, CFD? Let me first write the title of the, of the course. This is a new course, so I hope we have a good feedback so that we can really make it very good, so that you like it, and that you can also get something of the enthusiasm that we share with the CFD. So the acronym is Computational Fluid Dynamics. So what is uh, CFD? To give you an idea, I would like to give you two examples, main examples, a little bit uh, uh, different parts of it of my own research. So let's see if it's available here. So this is flow over a cylinder. So we have the cylinder here. And there is uniform flow coming from the left. And then what we see already here is an instantaneous picture of the vorticity. So there we can see how the flow rotates. Here it is rotating counterclockwise, the red, and clockwise, the blue. So that is the so-called vortex shedding. This is a Reynolds number of 150. So then, let's try to animate it. So you see what is happening. There is a so-called vortex shedding and once uh, the vortices are shed from the lower, then from the upper, and then we see here the Karman vortex stream. So that is calculated by solving the compressible Navier-Stokes equations with a high order finite difference method. Let's see another example of the same kind. That is, again, the cylinder. But now we look on the broader scale. The cylinder you can not see it, it's actually here. You can just see the trace of the common vortex street. The interest in this case was to simulate the acoustic waves emitted from these shedding vortices. And that is what you can hear when you are sometimes walking under a cable, and then you hear a tone, that is the aeolian tone. And that is simulated in this example. Get it started. Doesn't want to start. Disappearing below. <laughs> That's tricky. can see at least a little bit of it. Try to make it a little bigger. So you see the acoustic waves emitting more or less down and up. So imagine there is a, a cable, electric cable, and you walk below, then you will hear this tone. And it is varying with the wind speed. So therefore, it is not just one tone, 
depend, depending on the wind speed, it will vary. So that is interesting for uh, so-called computational air acoustics. If we want to uh, get airplanes less noisy, then we have to study acoustics. So that was this example. Now let's see another one. That is now from aerodynamics. Here we have a NACA 0012 airfoil that is a typical airfoil for, that is studied where we have good experimental results, good numerical results. And this is a computation where the inflowing Mach number is supersonic. So it is about, I think it's twice the speed of sound, so it's Mach 2. And then here you see it's starting from uniform flow and then suddenly the flow is moving on. It's coming a little bit at an angle of attack. That is a, not in X direction, but a little, I think it's 10 degrees. And then the Reynolds number, based on the chord length, that is from the leading edge to the trailing edge, is 1,000. So there's a very low Reynolds number, but uh, it was to study this phenomenon. And what you can see here is the Mach number. Now you see again this, the initial phase starting from zero velocity, and suddenly the flow is coming. This is a so-called shock wave. In the shock wave, the flow is compressed behind it. And so because from here, from high speed, the velocity will go down to zero on the airfoil. And that is done via this shock wave. Of the shock wave, the flow changes dramatically. It's just a very small distance. And the pressure, density, temperature go up, the velocity goes down. So that is a calculation that you can also find on the home page. And that's this animation and also the computation is due to Ara Sköjen, who did this master's thesis for me uh, two years ago. So that was this example. And this is another one that is a uh, flow over a fighter aircraft, and that is just seen in a two-dimensional sense. So here in this case, you can ex uh, imagine it is extended in this direction uniformly. So it's not real airfoil, real aircraft, but it is a two-dimensional uh, calculation. In this case, we'll see later the animation in this sense. The flow is coming with Mach number 2 from uniform flow, and then we have two uh, engines exiting at the exit at uh, Mach number 3. So, let's see if that works. Oh. I think it's in the back. Oh, oh right, right. <laughs> Well, maybe I skip it and later retrieve it and uh, we can continue. So these examples show you just a few examples from research, but if you go to the homepage of the course, you will see a link where you can, it's, uh, let's see, we have a link here. And there you can find many more examples from research centers, from CFD tools, for example, we have one of the most used ones are Fluent, CFX, Star CCM Plus, and um, then you find a lot of examples there. But instead of going in, you can do that yourself. I would like to hand over to Reda to give you the CFD demo. Yeah, let's see if we can make this work.
So the field of CFD has been expanding more and more, and if you look at these examples, they get more and more realistic. In the past, we were happy to compute just flow, say, uh, over a cylinder, and uh, just with incompressible flow, no, we can do it with compressible flow, we can have much more uh, complex geometries, complete aircrafts, and we have also interaction with other disciplines, for example, uh, with the structures, fluid structure interaction, we have electromagnetics, I have a PhD student working on electrocoalescence, so when we try to dewater, to get away the water from the oil by applying an electric field so that the, uh, that the water drops coalesce and fall on the bottom so that it can be removed. So it, it's, uh, it's getting more and more interesting. Um, one question first. Uh, do we have anybody here who does not understand Norwegian? We have one. Aren't you? Excellent. It's always somebody. You don't feel bad about it. I just wanted to be sure. So uh, we will. I think we have every material also in English. Is not that right? Yes. Yeah. 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 <coughs> this is uh, a little program that I uh, wrote some years ago. So uh, this is uh, an attempt to, to solve the Navier Stokes, two dimensional and uh, incompressible. And here on a uniform uh, grid. So it's quite crude. You see it's uh, 30 by 30 cells. And uh, for this course, this will sort of be our aim. This is what we are striving for to achieve how to solve the Navier Stokes. And then uh, do some simulations. Here I have said it's a classical test case of a square cavity. So uh, the solid red there is uh, walls standing still but the top wall is pink meaning he's moving and due to viscosity he is going to set the fluid inside the box in motion so if we now try to run an animation you will see how the flow develops the velocity is a little bit big so we will get one major vortex in the center. We will have some secondary vortices uh, down in, in the corners. Here, Reynolds number around 5,000. And that's um, actually on the limit. If I push the Reynolds number, he will explode because uh, I don't have any turbulence model here. So uh, it will be highly unstable. So. Uh, for every flash that you see here, for every time step, he then has to solve 30 by 30 cells. So and that's roughly 1,000. And he has three unknown for each cell, two velocities and one uh, pressure. And uh, the way he solves it, it's a very crude, uh, actually, uh, solution to the Poisson equation, meaning uh, roughly 30 iterations for each time step. So even a small laptop is capable of crunching some numbers. Here, this is a Fortran execute file, so it has been compiled. If we try to do this in MATLAB, we could wait until dinner, I think, before he was finished. So it's way slower. Of course, in this course, we are going to use, uh, use uh, MATLAB. <coughs> And MATLAB only. I don't think we will have time for Fortran moving. Really. No. So uh, I assume here everybody here is an expert in MATLAB, of course. Yay! <laughs> Excellent. So uh, we will uh, start immediately next week using MATLAB. Uh, do we have anybody here who has never touched MATLAB? Okay. Anybody here has used MATLAB less than 10 hours, 50 hours, 100 hours? Okay, so you have some experience. Um, we have uh, some hours in, uh, when is that, uh, Tuesday? We have restarted with the exercise on Monday. Yeah, that's Monday. And that yeah. is the point that we have to discuss because yeah. it's rather late and uh, I think we should try to change it. So yeah. Shall we discuss that now? 
that's okay. I'm finished, so you, you can get back to this one. Yeah. Well, regarding the hours, um, the lesson on Monday is scheduled from 6 to 8 in the evening. So, my question, or our question is, can we have that earlier? So, um, the question is when? So, it should be convenient, uh, essentially, hopefully for all of you. So, let me try to make a little call. So, it is now, what we are discussing is the lesson on Mondays. So it is scheduled right now from 18 to 20. So um, the possibility, well, we, should, we could try to have it from that time or even earlier. Okay. So let, let us give it to a, few, a few examples here. Let's see, we could also have it in the morning. Um, Maybe we, we can, this should be okay for all of you. But uh, I think we should try to have it earlier, that is our suggestion. So let me ask you, for whom of you is it not possible to have it on this date? Okay, so it's a couple of people, let me. Possible. For whom is it not possible to have it from 14 to 16. For whom it is not possible to have it from 12 to 14. Okay. Well, we can continue. <laughs> so for whom it is not possible to have it on this this time. Okay. <laughs> okay. And I think we don't take it very much. <laughs> so what do we do? That's a problem. So it seems that um, in the end there are so many, I think, uh, well, let's see if it's working, of course. Um, so still it's five people, not possible. So for this, so I think we, we keep it. So, We can try if we find an additional room, say from 12 to 14. Then we use both. Okay, it's a little luxury. Yeah. But uh, that's an option. That's right. Yeah. If we can find a room, that's it. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so that, that would be a possibility. Mm. So for, for those who is, for whom it's possible then to come at that time, it's okay. And then for the others, uh, we would have it a later one. We, we can give it a try at least. We have to ask for a room and then uh, we decide on okay, Let's see, this time we cannot have it in our room because we have lunch time in our, in our uh, in seminar room. Okay, we'll try it. <coughs> so I'll tell you uh, next week. So it will probably not, uh, I probably will not get an answer by tomorrow. So therefore, We'll probably start with the lesson really as scheduled on Monday at this time, and then on Tuesday it is clear it is from uh, 16 to 18, so from 4 to 6 in the afternoon. I think that is okay. Yeah. So the plan was then to use the Monday lectures as guidance to the exercises. Uh, the lecture on Tuesday, that will be me standing here and then running demonstrations. Uh, first time, uh, show some simple MATLAB, how to get started, if anybody is a little uncertain there. So we have a nice and easy start. But then uh, also give you some hint to next week's exercise, and also take up uh, topics from last week's exercise, if there were any, any problems. So uh, we will use the Tuesday lectures a little as a buffer, more or less. I don't think you will be teaching on Tuesdays. No, 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 no. And then the lecture here, of course, uh, today and then tomorrow morning. Okay, 
So now I think I got it here. So now the flow is coming from the left, from this example from the F-22 fighter aircraft. And we see again here uh, some shock wave in front, this one here. So here, around here is the apex. You can uh, see the aircraft uh, below. This is so by a special technique called Cartesian grid method, where we essentially also sold in the airplane, but we discard it. Here it is displayed, it has no meaning. And here the engine fire, and we see here uh, a, uh, also a, a certain structure in, uh, created by the high-speed engines. So what is happening now, it is again as before, starting from uniform flow, and then suddenly the flow is coming in, and then now we are computing in time for a steady state. So you see how, the, now this is the other one, we have already seen that. And so we compute the steady state, the stationary solution with this approach, starting from um, zero flow and then having the shock wave moving in. So that are, and also you saw now a few examples of uh, CFD. Regarding the objective of the course, the objective is to introduce the basics of computational fluid dynamics. Of course, it's, as the name says, and the goal is to make you familiar with the numerical solution of model equations in fluid mechanics. We'll come back to this point later. And another objective is to assess the quality of numerical results and the efficiency of numerical methods. That is something that will, you will be exposed to when you use a CFD tool. You get results, you get nice pictures, but how can you trust them? So you should know what are the possible uh, difficulties in getting good results. Can you trust them? Can you not trust them? So to assess then the quality of the results. And if you use methods, you can choose, for example, influence, star CCM plus, and so on. You can choose options so that you choose the right ones. Get aware of that. And another objective is to train MATLAB programming. So MATLAB is a nice tool. You could also use some other language. But here we want to focus on that because it makes life, as you saw uh, in the demo by Radar, uh, quite easy. We have a possibility to program and to visualize at the same time. And that is also important for you to learn because when you use a CFD tool, you will be also probably asked to define functions, user-defined functions. And then you have to know something about what is in it and also to do a little program. So that is um, regarding the objectives, the prerequisites. That is mathematics and calculus for, so mathe theory. So just for our own interest, we would like to know, so who of you has taken uh, mathe theory M? So that is calculus for M. Can you raise your hand? For M. None? Okay. Who has taken mathe for N? Okay, very good. Okay. And for those uh, not from NTNU, that is corresponding here, it is the final math course in the second year. And uh, in here it is taught uh, numerics. That is important for us in Mathe Fiere N. There is also taught, uh, as I know, uh, Fourier transformation. And uh, did you also have Laplace transformation? Okay. Well, for us here, the most important thing is numerics. You have use of the other transformations also, but uh, the numerics is most important. So those not from NTNU, if you had had some numerics course, basic numeric course, then it's fine. Regarding fluid mechanics, um, I suppose uh, all NTNU students, you have had a TP4100, uh, 4105, or 4110 course. So who? has not had any fluid mechanics course, let me ask that. Okay, that's good. That is very much needed. And Radar, you asked already on the MATLAB. So those, for those of you who have not that much experience in MATLAB, please contact Radar or Jürgen or me, 
we are very ready to help you to give you a primer and help you get started. Regarding requirements, let's see. Here the FAG information or course information, and there we have the, the requirements, and that is uh, the uh, nine of ten assignments should be approved. That should be by the end of the last lesson. So before the course ends, by the end of the course, you should be approved of nine out of twelve assignments. Regarding the handed the handing in of the exercises. Um, we have made a little change uh, before we ask you to send it to Alexander. By the way, he has already arrived. Here is Alexander. He will be the teaching assistant of the course. So instead of sending Alexander an email or emails, you are asked to submit your exercises uh, via its learning. And um, it's good if you zip them to one file so that Alexander has them all compact just in one file and you can submit this then on its learning. If you have any questions on that, just ask one of us. We have already discussed the organization, so we'll try to find a room from 12 to 14. For those, uh, if we lucky with that, then probably most of you can come then and for the others we'll have an extra also from 18 to 20 hours. Regarding exam, that is already scheduled for June 6. We have already discussed the home page. For those of you who have not yet access to its learning, please contact Rada uh, during the break. He will give you access. Um, let's see, what else do we have? This is the preliminary term plan. And that comes then gives us to the contents of the course. So today we already seen a few CFP examples and uh, we shall continue when we are done with this uh, with a little introduction and uh, going to giving uh, examples of PDEs, partial differential equations. And tomorrow we'll look at the sources of errors that we can have in numerical computations, in particular here in computational fluid dynamics. Week 3 and 4 we will look at time discretization of ordinary differential equations. That is important in its own but also for us because if we think of uh, time dependent problems we need to discretize in time. So that is uh, important that we take in the beginning. And then we go into the spatial discretization. Uh, I want to change a little bit the order from the book, that is something that I have not yet told you. This is the book, I'll come to that in a minute. In the break you can have a look at it. And I want to take first the heat equation. And then go to the hyperbolic equation, to the wave equation, and then to the nonlinear equation, which has quite interesting features, the Burgess equation, and then we'll look at the key example of elliptic, equations, Poisson and Laplace equations. Then we'll look at the solution of linear systems. They are not just uh, simple 1D, multi-D. Then we use probably iterative methods, as in the example that Beda showed. And then we have also here the 2D convection diffusion equation. We'll discuss this as it comes, but we'll, I'll say a little bit in a minute. In the end, we have a summary and an ex exam example. Because this is a new course, we want to give you an example of what you can expect in the exam. And what is also interesting, to look at the theoretical parts of the exercises. So, regarding the book, that is this one here. And that is the book by Fletcher, Tenhill and Anderson, Computational Fluid Mechanics and Heat Transfer. 
so there are a couple of older editions, they are equally valid. So this is the third edition, currently from 2013, but the older edition are useful as well. And we plan to put a PDF file of the second edition on its learning. Yeah. <coughs> it's out under it's material. Already there. Okay, very good. Very good. Okay. So here it is. So then you can download it. But it is meant for your use in the course, not to spread it. But that is then uh, there you have the basics, so book is, uh, but you can buy it, it's, however it is relatively expensive. Let's see what else. Yeah, most uh, now important. Do we have questions? Yes. Is all exercises in MATLAB? Yeah, I would say yes. Most of them will, uh, will uh, be something you have to program. I mean, you can learn numerics by reading a lot of theory, but first of all, it's boring, and second, you don't understand it anyway. So, so an exercise has to be handled. You have to sort of crunch the numbers and get some action on the screen. Uh, of course, that raises the question, how then should we make the exam? If you are just trained on programming and you get an exam, there's no programming. But uh, that's our problem, so we'll come back to that. So uh, it will be uh, also programming like questions on the exam, definitely, yes. But for all the exercises, I would say uh, the, the answer will be a MATLAB program uh, that you then zip together in one file and uh, upload on its learning. So that should be uh, the way. Uh, of course, if you have questions and would like to write them on your, uh, on your uh, answer, you can do that, just write a comment file on the MATLAB script, but much easier try to talk you know, or ask any of us directly. I think on Mondays you will also be present during uh, the, the guidance hours. The students will be there, Vitas will be there, and you can ask me on Tuesdays, and you can even uh, try to ask uh, during the lectures. Yes. Yeah. I think there was another question. It was yes. the same. Okay. <laughs> okay. Are there further questions? Okay, if not, then we start. So, just uh, what we have already done a lot of the introduction, but still, I um, just want to give you a brief uh, glimpse. So, so, what we are doing here is the computational approach. What we need for that is we need a mathematical model that is in general a partial differential equation. So we'll come back to that in a minute. And we, the mathematical model is then discretized. We need a discretization. So the PDE is then sold at this discrete point that is called discretization, uh, and that is done by a numerical method. For example, um, the discretization type that we are going to use is called finite difference method. So we replace the derivatives, part of derivatives, by differences. We'll see that tomorrow. And then this discrete system is sold on a computer. So we get in the end some algebraic system equations. So on the computer. And that is a usually a really powerful one. The things that we have here and that also you have your laptop, that is 
more powerful than the supercomputers in the 1980s or 90s. Why? Because computing power has been increasing tremendously. If you look, read the book, it says it has the computing power, the number of floating point operation, that is plus minus times divide, that you do per second, has increased by a factor of 10 every three and a half years. So in 10 years, you have a thousand times faster computer. So, and the computers have got actually cheaper. So therefore, this approach is very attractive for industry. You have, of course, also different approaches. The experimental approach, for example, the examples we saw, you would fabricate, make a model of an airfoil, put it into the wind tunnel, and measure it. You can do that, and it is very important to have both, because, as you shall see, we have some pitfalls, some difficulties with CFD, especially when it comes to high Reynolds number flow, because then we have turbulence, and that is really nasty. But in the wind tunnel, we put in the wind tunnel, get our measurements, it's fine. But it's quite expensive to have it expendable. So that is approach number two, experimental approach. Approach number three is the theoretical approach. That is what you learned in fluid mechanics, when we simplify the equations to ordinary differential equations that we can solve. But what, you, what we saw there, Poisson flow or Hagen Poisson or whatever, it's very, very simplified. So we are very limited by solving the equations theoretically. It's still open question, I think there was a Russian claiming it has yet solved it, about whether the Navier-Stokes equations governing fluid flow are in a sense well posed. That if you have a smooth initial condition that the solution will stay smooth later on. So it, it is mathematically really challenging. So therefore this theoretical approach is rather limited and the approach that is therefore very important and used quite a lot is the computational approach. Regarding the history of the CFD, I just want to make a brief, uh, give you a brief uh, um, PowerPoint on that, uh, regarding the, some key figures. So it has been advanced uh, since, you can say, the 1950s. So this is one of the key figures in the beginning, uh, John von Neumann. He did his research in the US during World War II, and he found out that stability is very important. If you want to solve something, find a difference method, then in time, you want that your solution stays stable, that it doesn't run away, explodes, but that you get uh, results that are limited in a sense and close to the exact solution that you want to approximate. So that was important work done by John von Neumann. Then we have here Peter Lax. He did important work for uh, theory and also numerical computation that is interesting to us of flows with shocks that we saw in the beginning. This is a bow shock. And he actually got the Abel Prize, which is given by Norway, uh, in 2005. So he is also, he's originally, I think, from Hungary, but he has been living and doing research in the United States. And then we have Sergei Godunov, a Russian, who invented, you could say, the basics of the finite volume method. That is a method that we don't treat here, but I'll give you a glimpse of it. And um, that has been very important for computing flows, really, with strong shock waves, very difficult problems. And the one who made this approach popular in the West and extended it to higher order was uh, the Dutch Bram van Leer. And he has been teaching now for a long time in the University of Michigan in the United States. And then we have Stanley Osher from UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, 
and he has also been contributing to computing flows with the shocks, but also he has invented a method that we have been using also here called the level set method. And you have an interface between two phases, say uh, water and air, whereas the interface, you can track that by using uh, another variable telling you where this uh, interface is. And then it's called level set method. And finally, in my list here, is Anthony Jameson. He's an Englishman, but has also been doing the work in the uh, US. He's now uh, at uh, Stanford University. And as you see in his hand, he has been very fond of aerodynamics. And the codes that he has been developing are used by many aircraft companies. Boeing and, uh, well, Airbus has developed its own, but some of them are also based on the schemes by Jameson. So these are a few figures. I limit myself to this. Uh, so you could say much more about it. But uh, it's, uh, uh, this CFD field is quite active. It is uh, developing in more and more disciplines and uh, getting uh, more and more realistic. Okay, so then we have that. And the point that I want to start after the break is to give you an idea of PDEs. Before doing that and before we go into the break, let me just ask you regarding your background in partial differential equations. So, um, have you seen, say, the wave equation? Yes. Very good. And uh, the Poisson equation? Okay. Good. And uh, the, say, the heat equation? Okay. Very good. So then probably I can limit the next part a little bit. But still I want to give you some, some general background. Today it will be more the physical background, and then tomorrow a more mathematical background. Okay, with that we take the break, and for those of you who have uh, not yet access to its learning, please contact Radar. Any questions, just contact.